Hello again. I'm Virginia Kaklamani uh, from UD Health San Antonio. And uh, every year we have a committee that uh, votes for the McGuire Awardee of the Year. Uh, we request um, uh, for everybody to send us nominations, and then the committee looks at the nominations and goes through a pretty rigorous process of deciding who the McGuire Awardee should be this year. This year I have the distinct honor to present the McGuire Award to Dr. Jack Cusack. Dr. Jack Cusick is uh, uh, coming to us from the uh, Center for Cancer Prevention at Queen Mary University in London. Dr. Cusick has had an, an, an exceptional career both in prevention of breast cancer as well as treatment of early stage breast cancer. In the field of prevention, he identified the role of tamoxifen in the prevention of contralateral breast cancer. That led to the IBIS-1 trial, and then that followed by the IBIS-2 trial that he also led, looking at aromatase inhibitors in the field of prevention of breast cancer. He also reported on the role of breast density in increasing breast cancer risk. He developed the Tyracusic model that I know all of us use in clinic every single day in calculating breast cancer risk for our patients, and most recently has also incorporated multi-gene assays to the uh, Tyracusic model. He was one of the principal investigators of the ATAC trial, which was presented at this meeting back in 2003. And he created the IHC-4 algorithm that provides simple and accurate ways of calculating prognosis for early stage breast cancer. And then subsequently, the CTS-5 score that calculates risk of late recurrence. He has had several awards, and I just wanted to mention the Cancer Research UK Lifetime Achievement Award, the American Society, uh, Society's Medal of Honor. And he was also awarded the Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire Award, which is one of the highest UK honors. So I want to uh, thank him. I want to welcome him. I want to congratulate him for being the uh, Maguire Awardee for this year and look forward to his presentation. Well, thank you, Virginia, for that very nice award. I'm really honored to have this. And really, to, on behalf of prevention, I think it might be the first time that prevention's actually been recognized by the McGuire Award, which is so important. And uh, I, I just think it's the way forward is the, cardio you know, the cardiologist knew about prevention, and they deal with it routinely. You don't wait for somebody to get a heart attack and then treat them. You give them statins or whatever they need to prevent the heart attack. And I think the challenge is, how do we bring that idea into cancer now? And uh, breast cancer is a great place to start because we really have quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of evidence uh, to sort of support that. So let's see, just, um, it's just a, this. The green button, thank you. Okay, so um, I have a bit of, a few disclosures about the fact that the Tyracusic model is actually uh, organized, it's run by the uh, Cancer Research UK for commercial use and I get an honorarium from that, so royalty, so that, that's. Uh, okay, I wonder, the, 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 um, the real, ch I mean, we really have to recognize that breast cancer is clearly the most dominant cancer and it's rapidly rising. This is the recent Global Can data from 2020, looking at the four major cancers in women, breast, colorectal, cervix, and lung. And you can see that not only was breast cancer most common, but it is hugely rising in the last decade. And that's mostly in the developing world, but breast cancer is, is, is a really major, major problem in, worldwide. Over two million cases a year now that we have to deal with, and on the rapid rise. So if there ever was a cancer that needed uh, some work on prevention, it definitely is breast cancer. So there are a number of approaches to breast cancer. The classic ones, which are really the general population ones, is you know control your weight, uh, eat a good diet, get exercise. Uh, there's reproductive factors in terms of having your children young and be careful about uh, HRT and some of the ex exogenous hormones. Those things all work. They have small benefits. 
Uh, we've been fairly unsuccessful in actually having that be a major in, uh, influence on breast cancer just because people don't really like doing these things. So the, the, um, and people like to just do what they feel like. So the other approach is to sort of try to identify high-risk women and focus our efforts on them. Um, and there are two, really two aspects of that. And our Tyra Cusick model was set up to, to, um, to try to uh, support this. First of all, the identification of high-risk women. I mean, the crucial thing for which there was really a lot of uncertainty when we were doing our IBIS-1 trial, we basically developed this model so we could predict someone who was at, at least twice the population risk. Um, and then once you've got high-risk women, it isn't too much point in knowing that they're high-risk unless you're going to do something about that. So effective, minimally toxic, non-toxic is probably, we're asking for too much, but minimally toxic prophylactic agents is, is, is the order of the day. So there are a number of approaches. The CIRMs with tamoxifen, of course, were the ones that were first developed while, and, and, and have been very successful. More recently, they've been taken over by the aromatase inhibitors for postmenopausal women in treatment and potentially now also, I think, for prevention. I want to show you some, some new data on that. And then there are some other things that are really kind of in the background that uh, we shouldn't forget, but they're not really being progressed very rapidly. So Virginia pointed out that the first, the first evidence that we actually had for prevention with tamoxifen was the NATO trial, and we published in 1985. And I must say that prevention is a hugely collaborative group, and I like to sort of acknowledge as many of my colleagues that have been fundamental in making this happen. Mike Baum ran many of the early tamoxifen trials and was a great supporter of clinical trials. And in our NATO trial, uh, we noticed that, in fact, um, that uh, very small numbers at this stage, but uh, that if we looked at new contralateral tumors in women with breast cancer, but didn't have a recurrence of opposite breast, that, in fact, they were much reduced by tamoxifen, reduced from 10 cases to three. Very, very small numbers, but this was the first report, and that's now 40 years ago, I guess, um, for, for the fact that tamoxifen does actually not only treat breast cancer well, but it is highly effective in breast in pre prevention. And that's been, that's been confirmed now in many, many studies, but this was the first, first observation of that. That led uh, myself and another sadly not with us now, colleague uh, Mick Bulbrook and Dennis Wang, uh, to actually write a, a position paper about what we need to do to prevent breast cancer. And that came out just the next year, 86, uh, which was a, basically a, 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 a rationale for actually getting on with doing big breast cancer prevention trials. 1986, that was. So that's, again, a long, long time ago. Uh, published in The Lancet, and we did get quite a lot of interest, but the thing was really hard work um, to, to get going. So, um, um, so let's just go, can we just, oops, I want to go back one. Can I go back one? Okay. So anyway, we started that, and, um, and, um, uh, I, think, I think we missed a slide there. Anyway, the, there were a number of trials. We proposed this, as I said, in 1980s, you know, in very, very early on. The, 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 UK, the U.S. was the first to actually get on with prevention trials. It ran the big P1 trial of over 13,000 women at high risk uh, starting in 1992. Uh, it actually was preceded by the pilot study for our study. That was Trevor Pohl's quote, pilot study. It was meant to be 100 patients originally, but it kept going on because we had so much, so much uh, hassle getting the things going. I mean, uh, getting prevention trials going was really a huge challenge. I like to, I think that's now this, this next is, I like to say that, that the prevention of breast cancer was the trial not even Kafka could take on <laughs> because of the nonsense that we had to deal with. We had, we had, um, uh, people say, oh, you can't give tamoxifen because of liver cancer, because they'd shown that high doses of tamoxifen caused liver cancer in rats, ignoring the fact that two million women had taken tamoxifen and there was no evidence whatsoever. So we went through a whole range of things. And the fact that I'm not medically trained, uh, you know, I, I had a huge sort of, some of the problems with the higher uh, establishment of, 
how can he be trying to lead a prevention trial? So anyway, um, after many, many years of fighting and so forth, we finally, and, and the great pilot study that Trevor Poles did, that carried on for much longer than he thought, and it ended up being the largest breast cancer uh, pilot study probably in history of 2,500 patients. We did get on finally to start the IBIS-1 study, which was just a study of 7,000 women taking tamoxifen or placebo for, for um, five years. Now, although we had proposed these things, the, the U.S., I must say, beat us to actually getting trials started because of the, the, they were very rapid and moved forward. And the P1 study actually started before this. But one of the challenges I think that's terribly important in prevention as well is to realize that prevention is a long-term game. And um, the P1 study was actually stopped declaring success after four years of follow-up because they had a reduction in new breast cancers in the first four years. And they actually missed all of the major, major important points that I'll show you a little bit of as well that in fact, if you're gonna be doing prevention, you're talking about things that are gonna go on for 20 years. People could get breast cancer and then they'll eventually, some of them will die of it. And unless you have a really good long-term follow-up, uh, you're gonna miss the main points. So this is, the, uh, this is just some brief data. Now it's out to almost 20 years of follow-up, looking at the effect of IBIS-1 study. We had a, what, a 32% or 28% reduction in the first 10 years. You can see incidence in this high-risk population was reduced from 6.3 to 4.6%. And the number needed to treat to prevent one breast cancer in 10 years was 59. Well, that was pretty good. And as good as any other prevention sort of study in other areas comes along. But the real amazing thing is that we carried on the follow-up uh, the last report is at 16 years median follow-up, but we have a lot of people going, women going out to 20 years. And the results were astounding in the second 10 years in the sense that uh, even though you stop treatment at five years, this is five years of treatment, the benefits in the second 10 years, from years 10 to 20, were actually bigger than they were in the first 10 years. You can see another 6.6% of the placebo arm got breast cancer but only 3.3% or even a bigger reduction in the treated arm. So there's something about tamoxifen in the prevention setting that means that you take it for five years, you've probably changed the milieu enough that, uh, in fact, you've got long lifetime protection, prevention. And uh, you know, another 30% another were actually prevented in that, in that uh, second year. So you put this all together <coughs> and look at the 20-year follow-up we had overall a 30% reduction in breast cancer. The number needed to treat was now only 22, not 59. So for every 22 women that you give tamoxifen for five years, you prevent one breast cancer over that 20 year period. So a very, very exciting result that in fact, this is really a long-term uh, solution and to not do that long-term follow-up has really missed the major findings in these prevention trials. So, we're very excited about that, and uh, we'll continue that now with our IBIS-2 studies looking at the aromatase inhibitors. There also were some trials with raloxifene, which was originally set up to look for women with osteoporosis, the MORE trial, and a few other ones. I don't have time to go through all of that, uh, but it basically showed <coughs> actually bigger effects of raloxifene than with tamoxifen, but the numbers were small. Uh, so the STAR study started up with a huge trial, of almost 20,000 women, um, and uh, compared uh, raloxifene versus tamoxifen. And uh, the, the results were uh, of interest in that tamoxifen actually turned out to be a better preventive agent than raloxifene, although raloxifene had fewer side effects. Again, I don't have time to go into all that, but interesting. And overall, this was all of the CIRMs. Uh, there were, and we had overall about a 50% reduction if you put them all together, but much of that was based on the raloxifene and the lasofoxifene studies. I have to move on now fairly quickly to look at the aromatase inhibitors. Uh, and there are three that are clinically used, anastrozole, letrozole, uh, exmestane. And uh, the ATAC trial, of which I was statistician, turned out, again, you know, the, um, this ability to actually, breast cancer is unique in the fact that you give a drug to treat one breast in one, uh, cancer in one breast, and you actually can actually look at the other breast as a measure of how it's going to work in prevention. 
So anastrozole worked better than tamoxifen in terms of preventing recurrence, but the most interesting thing was that, uh, for, 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 for my purposes, or the purposes, was that it had a huge effect on contralateral breast cancer. Not a 30% reduction, but more like a 50% reduction uh, in hormone receptor positive breast cancers, reducing the number of cases from 53 down to 26. And that was the basis for us saying, well, we've got to take this into prevention and setting up IBIS-2, which was our second big prevention trial. So that study, because the effect sizes were bigger, didn't need to be quite so large. It was almost 4,000 women, a little bit less. Again, five years of anastrozole versus placebo. There is an argument about whether we should do it against tamoxifen, but we decided to, to go for placebo. Again, that's a long discussion. Uh, and the effects, uh, well, the effects were, as expected, really quite striking. If you looked at what happened in the first five years, follow-up on this study is now only out to just over 11 years, um, is that there was a, a big reduction. It was a 60% reduction in the five years of active treatment, reducing 4.6% having cancer down to 1.8. And interesting, if you looked at the next 10, uh, out, right, well, right out to 12 years, median is just over 10, we got an additional effect. The additional effect was not as big as the first effect, but we did get a substantial reduction, another 30% reduction, which was similar to tamoxifen in the second five, in the second period from years five to 12, plus that very, very big effect in the first five years. So it is a very strong preventive agent. And if you put that all together with 12 years of follow-up, the number needed to treat to prevent one breast cancer in 12 years is 29. Uh, and uh, that's actually better than tamoxifen at that time period as well. So um, good evidence for, for the fact that it's a highly effective agent. OK, so I want to sort of now finish with a little bit of some new work that we've done, focusing first on the IBIS-2 studies. Now, this, I think, is really exciting. I'm going to be giving some other short talks otherwise. But, but we, 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 in IBIS-1 and in IBIS-2, we took blood samples at baseline one year and five years in all women in the study. Now, although it's very clear from all the epidemiology that, oest that uh, estrogen is a very, very important risk factor for breast cancer, maybe the single most important factor, but it's rarely measured. So uh, I haven't yet to speak to a clinician who routinely measures uh, uh, estradiol in their cancer patients or patients at high risk of breast cancer. But I think there, there's evidence, there's need for change, and I'll show you just a bit of that now. Um, this, is, this is the evidence, again, showing that estradiol is a strong risk factor for, for breast cancer. The first batch up in the top is, um, shows, the, um, shows overall estradiol, and you can see a strong dose-response relationship, which is even stronger if you look at free estradiol. So it's the free estradiol that really matters. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> you can see just a very, very strong effect, you know, more than a two-fold risk change from the first to the fifth quintile in that group. <laughs> now, again, I don't have time to go through this in, in any kind of detail, but um, we, we, what we did is we went back to the IBIS-2 study where we had all these bloods. We actually measured estradiol, testosterone, and SHBG. <coughs> Excuse me. To, um, to be able to, to, to look at an approximation to free estradiol. And the primary analysis was basically looking at the estradiol SHBG ratio. And um, we broke patients up into quintiles. Altogether, there was um, 72 cancers in the anastrozole arm and uh, 142 in the, um, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, um, control arm. So altogether, it was a strikingly effective result. Uh, uh, for, you know, the, ha the, hazard, the benefit was 0.49, so almost a 50% reduction in new cancers, much better than tamoxifen, um, in this 11-year follow-up of uh, uh, the anastrozole in IBIS-2, going from 142 down to, to 72 cases. Uh, but interestingly, if you looked at the effect, in the placebo arm, you got the expected sort of thing that all the epidemiology has shown in, in, in just population studies. 
that the percentage of, of women getting cancer increases dramatically as you increase your estradiol levels. So this is measuring estradiol levels by, uh, well, it's the ratio of that divided by SHBG to approximate free estradiol in the four quartiles. And you can see that the percentage of women in each quartile rose rapidly in the placebo arm, 15% in the lowest 25%, going up to over 30% in the highest quartile. And that was very much in keeping with what we'd seen in the epidemiology, a highly significant PCO003 uh, p-value for, for, for this change, and it was about a 25% reduction on average, or increase on average, uh, for, each for one quartile change. But the most striking results was in the anastrozole patients, where in fact, there really was no effect at all of, of, of estradiol. It just disappeared. There's a little bit of an of a, of a, of a increase in the lowest quartile, but that's probably just chance. But in fact, the overall, there's, there's no trend at all. If you look at these numbers, 25 in the lowest quartile, 26.4 in the highest quartile, really nothing going on. So um, a very interesting finding, which I think has a large number of applications that we need to look at, in that uh, do we, you know, what is the point of giving an astrozole to women who have low, uh, <coughs> low estradiol levels, because there's really nothing to be gained. And again, overall, the reduction was 50% or 49%. But in fact, if you look at it by quartile, there was virtually nothing in the first quartile. The lowest 25% of women got virtually nothing except the side effects <laughs> for taking an astrozole. Uh, no significant difference, a tiny little difference, but no, nowhere near significant. But yet, and then if you look to the second, third, and fourth quartiles, you got this bigger than 50% reduction, about 55% overall. So I think there's a real challenge there. Estradiol actually in, is now quite cheap. We use a, a very sensitive uh, assay, and we got some, we get to, um, uh, you know, very, very, very good results on that. And it costs to do estradiol, testosterone, and SHBG, it costs 30 pounds, or 30, about $30, which is less than even the cost of a mammogram these days. So it, I, I don't really understand why we should, we, we clearly need to be thinking more like the cardiologist. We've got, a, we seem now to have in post, this is postmenopausal women, a very good marker for risk of breast cancer. It's not that expensive to measure, and there doesn't seem to be, from these early data, we clearly need more, more data on this. No benefit in giving anastrozole or probably any other, this is anastrozole, any other aromatase inhibitor um, for women who are, have low estradiol because, of course, the aromatase inhibitors work by blocking the, the, the enzyme of the gene that actually produces estradiol. So if you don't have any estradiol along, around, you're not gonna get much gain by blocking its production because there isn't very much being produced. But if you go to this high quartile, uh, there is a difference. And in fact, there's, it's so 30% of the women in the placebo arm got, uh, got cancer, and that was reduced down to 26%, or about a 56% reduction overall when you do all the analyses. I won't go through all that either. But I think a real challenge that we really should be thinking about uh, you know, this at least for prevention and maybe even for, for treatment, all of these women that are being given aromatase inhibitors to treat their postmenopausal breast cancer, it would be worthwhile, I think, doing some work to see whether or not who's actually winning, who's actually gaining from this. The estradiol measurement is easy, uh, and uh, it's yet to be done in the, in the adjuvant setting, but can we actually find uh, uh, who really is going to benefit and focus our treatment on the patients that are going to benefit from it and avoid the side effects in those that aren't. So this is, uh, this is um, a, 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 maybe a little harder to see, but it basically shows the risk of breast cancer, uh, the, no, the benefit of anastrozole according to your SHBG levels. This is the cutoff for the top quartile, and this is the cutoff for the lowest quartile, and here's the median in the middle. And you can see above the first quartile, the curve's pretty flat. You're getting that 50% reduction virtually for everybody there, and, and there's a little slight change in that. It's probably just small numbers. But in fact, uh, a big reduction right down to here. But once you get down in that lowest quartile, 
the benefit drops down to, well, I mean, it can't go really below zero, but that, that's, that's just fitting a quadratic curve. But really, the benefit is very, very little, as you saw in the, in, in the, in the, in the table, in women who have low estradiol levels. I think something really needs uh, some attention and potentially quite important changes in the way we go about managing breast cancer by, by, by using aromatase inhibitors in women who are going to benefit from them. So this is just briefly, as time's out, the similar things were seen with, with testosterone, but the effects were not quite so strong. We had a, just a, a, a significant, but a 20% reduction per quartile placebo arm. Again, no effect uh, uh, if in women who were given an astrosol. So in conclusion, it's well known that risk increases with increasing SHPG uh, sorry, Easter dial SHPG ratios when you're not treated. And that was clear, but there was little impact uh, of uh, an astrozole, uh, in low, uh, um, or little impact of SHPG, the ratio uh, in the anastrozole treated patients. They all did the same pretty much, regardless of whether they were high or low. Uh, and in particular, the ones that had started off with low levels had little benefit, they didn't change at all. It looks just like, like not having given it. And the crucial things is that measuring estradiol and SHPG may improve the risk benefit of anastrozole by selecting the patients you give it to, just the ones that you know are going to get something. And also, now that we've got, uh, we've got, um, we've got a ways to measure it easily, we, we actually need to do some work on what is the minimal dose that's actually going to reduce breast cancer, but hopefully, um, as we've seen with tamoxifen, low-dose tamoxifen does appear to to be beneficial, but it well reduces the side effects. So we, we, we can, you know, more rationally begin to, uh, to, um, to choose the right dose for individual women. So I'm quite excited about this. I'm supposed to be retiring this year, but I can see that there's quite a few years of work ahead to sort this out. So I will carry on doing that. And thank you very much for your attention. So we will move on to general session one, which starts at 9 o'clock. Thank you.